From Mexico? Yeah. Good eye. Oh, good. I'm not sure. Yeah. I just got it in shopping. Hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Nadia Al Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you, those of you in the audience and those of you who are joining us online. So this event is live streamed. Um, so today's event will be a conversation between my uh, colleague, Catherine Spellman poots um, who is an assistant, associate, sorry, associate professor at Columbia's Middle East Institute and the Aga Khan University in London. Her research focuses on women and gender dynamics in Muslim communities in the UK and the US. Catherine has a particular interest in rituals and cultural production within the context of diasporic spaces and their connections to wider social movements. And as uh, Catherine is just joining us from Colombia, she has been telling us quite a bit about uh, what is going on there, and it's uh, quite horrific, I should say. Um, now, uh, Catherine is going to introduce Amitis Motivelli to you in a moment, but I just wanted to say a few words about today's event, which is part of, a, of an ongoing series that Catherine and I have been running for over a couple of years, a series that's focusing on gender, body politics and arts in the Middle East and its diasporas. And we've been in conversation with artists um, from the Middle East, um, ma many of them based in the US right now, some of them sort of moving back and forth. Um, and uh, we've been in conversation with them to talk about the way that their art, um, their sort of cultural creative productions engage with issues of gender, body, gender-based violence, and also wider context of war and conflict. So we've um, talked to Palestinian artist Basil Abbas and Juan Abu Rahme, who evidently uh, have a pavilion, Palestinian pa uh, pavilion in Venice right now. The Venice Biennale was just open, I heard. It's a fantastic pavilion. We've also talked to Lebanese artist Tanya al um and Iranian artist Morshin Ali-Hari. And of course, Amitis was part of the series. And most recently, we talked to Palestinian Iraqi photographer and artist Sam, Sam al-Shaibi. So today's event uh, will be in the format, will be a conversation between the three of us and towards the end, I hope to be able to open up the floor for you to ask questions. Um, I would like to uh, give special thanks to uh, Art at Watson, particularly Joan Hart, really, without you this uh, and Art at Watson, this would not have happened. So please help me in thanking them. Um, after the event, I'd in, in, like to invite you to reception on the next floor, the second floor. I always get things mixed up. To my mind, this is still the ground floor, and the next one is the first floor, but it's the second floor. And the exhibition will uh, be on until the 8th of May. So I hope you'll be able to join us afterwards. So now I'd like to uh, ask Catherine to uh, introduce Amitis to us. Right. Um, well, first, thank you so much, Nadia. It's been such a joy working with you on this project, and um, it's one of these projects that's that's really enjoyable and interesting. And um, I look forward to continuing the work and um, what we produce from it as well. Um, and thank you so much to Barbara and for everyone else who helped organize uh, this event. Um, it's such a pleasure to introduce Ami. Um, Am Amitis Motavali was born in Tehran and moved to the U.S. in 1977, just before the Iranian Revolution. Um, her work explores the cultural resistance and survival of people living in poverty, conflict, and war. It asks questions about violence, occupation, and the past to de decolonization while invoking the significance of secular grassroots struggle. Her work includes both standalone projects and a variety of ongoing multidisciplinary um, series. In her recent series, Golistan Revisited, Amitis um, is working internationally with a broad uh, spectrum of transnational Muslims in order to research what defines home life 
and political religious conflict. She's particularly interested um, in conducting workshops with Southwest Asian, Northeast Africans in diaspora coming from places of political and religious conflict and collaborating on public art projects. Um, she's also the director of the William Grant Still Art Center in West Adams, South Central LA. And she's been honored with several awards, fellowships, and residencies in the United States and internationally. Um, I'd also, um, before we start the conversation, I want to um, also extend our sincere thanks to the Persian Heritage Foundation for supporting our project um, by gener generously funding Amitis's residence both here at Brown and at Columbia next semester. Um, so thank you so much for coming and I look forward to the conversation. Wonderful. So um, Amitis, before talking about the exhibition, obviously we want to focus on that, but I thought um, that it would be interesting for the audience to uh, find out a little bit about your wider inspirations for your work. And I know that your last name and the meaning it has um, is significant for your work. So can you tell the audience about that, your last name and Certainly. the wider work? Yeah. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I do want to take a quick uh, opportunity to thank Joanne Hart and Arda Watson. Really thank Eliza for all of the work that you've done and helped me out, and Barbara. Um, She's not here, but thank you so much, Barbara. Barbara's been amazing. And the two of you for this opportunity to be here and just kind of uh, sit in my work. Um, it's, it, it's a rare opportunity for a lot of artists, so it's been really wonderful. Um, my last name, Motavalli, uh, is, um, is a name that, that is given to people who care for shrines. And um, my family actually cared for a shrine in, um, in northern Iran. They still sort of are, even though, like most things that become corporatized, you know, in the, in the situation of Iran, uh, everything became nationalized and all of the shrines were <laughs> made uniform. So my family kept the shrine. I really remember the shrine as a child. It was very important to my father's family. Um, and it was made of wood. The, fa the community had to come together and they had to decide on the aesthetic. And then there were rituals around how you go to the shrine. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was very important. So I observed all of this and I um, came as a very young child to the United States. And um, the experiences here were so different from what I was seeing in Iran. And I was really trying to hold on to a memory of Iran because shortly thereafter the revolution happened. Mm -hmm. And um, lots of other things happened where I couldn't return for a long time. So yeah. the, the shrine was the one thing that was so prominent. And it seemed like it was not only prominent in my aesthetic, but it was also prominent in the way that um, my family operated. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of actually caring for and mourning people who have uh, in some way um, died, but were not necessarily mourned or honored, yeah. was something that, that uh, it's been lifelong. Yeah. Um, so, so it's definitely been an inspiration. And if um, we can go ahead and, and show the first slide, please. Thank you. Um, the other inspiration is just kind of the aesthetic of rituals in Iran. I'm showing this image of uh, an alam. Um, it's basically, there, there's a ritual called, uh, there's, there's a, a mourning, um, not a celebration, it's a mourning um, ritual for Ashura, where um, people come out into the public and Sorry they... Sorry maybe you can explain Ashura to people. Sure, know. sure. So, so um, Ashura is, is a commemoration of the um, assassination of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein being the grandson of the prophet. And <clears throat> it was in an attempt for the grandson to go into the city of Najaf and um, claim to be the, the direct heir of Islam. And in a battle between the caliphates and the Shia, um, or what became the Shia, the family, and the followers of the family, um, this uh, fallout happened where members of the family were killed, were imprisoned, and since that time to the present, every year, 
there's a commemoration of mourning. And it becomes this, this uh, ritual mourning that, that the public gets to do um, in the name of Imam Hussein, but it becomes uh, a mourning in general for whatever it is that people are grieving. However, I mean, it's pretty layered. Uh, Ashura is really layered. I'm really giving you a simple uh, version of it. And I'm sure Mehrdad, who's here, uh, has a more uh, expansive uh, um, uh, explanation of Ashura. But what happens is that people come out into the public and rituals are brought into the public realm. And it's not unlike what um, people would see Sufis do, where ritual practices come into the public realm. So this alam became really important to me. It was just aesthetically so interesting, because there's all these people who come together. They make the, all these elements. And Ashura ultimately kind of becomes a parade, right? Parade of mourning, but it's a parade. And in some ways, it's not entirely mourning because there are a lot of young people out. A lot of men will take off their shirts and show their bravado and engage in, in rituals. And it becomes an act of a kind of erotic flirtation among people. Um, it becomes you know, some acts of homoerotic um, flirtation. And there's just so many layers going on. So it was so interesting to me when I first saw it, I was kind of scared as a child. But the aesthetics of the street changed. Lights were turned green all of a sudden. Um, you know, people were out wailing in public and it kind of became the music, the, the sonic vibration of the city. And this stayed in my memory because I'm a small child. We leave. All of a sudden, I didn't even know we're going to come here and never see my, a, a lot of my family members again. And then, um, and then certain things really stuck in my head. And some of them were the rituals of going to the, um, the shrine. Mm -hmm. Some of them were the rituals around Ashura. And then others were the rituals that my, my grandfather on my mother's side was a Sufi, so he would have rituals. And I remember some of those rituals. So those really kind of remained in my head. I'm not sure why. And, and it started to pop up in my work. And it wasn't until I had um, a conversation with Nader Khalili. And he'd been looking at my work. And he said, well, you're really carrying out your, your namesake. You know, you're definitely are, are the, the keeper of the shrine. Because I was actually constantly trying to rebuild this shrine, mm -hmm. either on the street or elsewhere. So um, I think that's, in a way, some of the aesthetic presence. But then the way that I started to do it as, as a young person was, I grew up in LA. I was hanging out in East LA. We, we lived in East LA. We were the only Iranians in East LA. So that added to the aesthetic of what I, what I bring. And uh, my mentors were all in South Central LA. So I started to do graffiti as a young person. And I think I was 21 years old. I was going to meet a friend of mine, or a friend of mine was supposed to come and pick me up, actually. And he didn't show up. And I, cussing him out, didn't know what happened. Then I got a phone call from his sister. Uh, apparently, he was walking down the street, and um, police saw him. Uh, they tried to stop him, and he started to run, and he was pulling up his pants. And as he was pulling up his pants, he was shot in the back. And he uh, dropped on the street. Um, this was all described to me, dropped on the street, and um, died on the street, and his body was left on the street for about 16 hours. And I thought about, I went down, I, I went down to the neighborhood, and I thought about how that's affecting his family. I thought about how that is affecting the neighborhood, all the children in the neighborhood, just seeing this man who was alive, very kind. Um, had a life, went to school with a lot of people in the neighborhood, um, had a mom, had sisters, and how people were able to actually mourn that because police were surrounding them and if they got close to his body, they drew their weapons on, on the neighborhood. So I started, I made a stencil of his face and I wrote, um, killed by police. I wrote the date and I wrote in loving memory and I started to stencil that around the neighborhood, and I noticed that people started to put candles up. So this notion of a shrine wasn't something that was just Iranian. It became something that I really noticed happening in a lot of 
uh, the neighborhoods that I was growing up in. So those aesthetics kind of merged. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what was the shrine in Iran in honor of? Is it one particular? So or? it's curious. His name was Imam Zadi Yahya, and there are like thousands of Imam Zadi Yahyas mm -hmm. that there are shrines to. Not thousands, but hundreds. Mm -hmm. He was probably a um, he was probably a rich guy. He, that's probably how the shrine was named after him. He was probably wealthy, and he was um, he distributed food or or money to people, and he was holy. He he had gone he had done his Hajj and you know done all of the things that he was supposed to do more than likely, uh, and it was actually shrined before him, and more than likely it was it was um, a fire temple or it was a shrine that was uh, dedicated to some element of nature. Yeah, uh, before Islam. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Great. Um, well, you have a particular interest in the effect of the war on terror, mm -hmm. um, especially when it started to get automated with drone warfare after 2009. Um, so can you tell us about the research you did on the various ways the war on terror affected women and girls? Yeah, yeah. So um, 2012, I had the opportunity, actually before that, I started to do research, and I was really interested in how um, women and girls were, were being affected by the mass um, uh, exodus out, out of the, the kind of the regions that are called Middle East, um, but also uh, North and East Africa. And I uh, started to do research, and I got a residency to um, stay in uh, in Denmark and Northern Europe for a few months. And while I was there, I started to have workshops with young women. And while I'm doing this, um, their brothers were at the same time being recruited by ISIS. And so um, it was really an interesting phenomenon watching, um, watching a community that uh, was pretty poor, didn't have access to um, they couldn't really get jobs because they were newly out of refugee camps. They had to be in refugee camps for about four years in Denmark. And at that time in Denmark, um, masjids weren't allowed, so people weren't allowed to go and pray in mosques. They had to kind of have a makeshift. They would create their own situations, but they weren't allowed to have this um, kind of religious relief that a lot of people felt like they needed it because they were fleeing war or, or famine or you know some situation. And so um, I'm going to skip a couple of slides and bring you to this. So um, I started to do a project. It's an extensive project. And if I get into it, we'll be here all day. But it's actually launching very soon. Um, in um, May 16th, actually, in Los Angeles, we're going to launch this database. So for years, I did research. I started to do research on women and girls who were being killed um, post-war on terror because I noticed that a lot of times women and girls were just not being recognized in any way. And it was this one particular uh, incident. It was after a, a bombing in France. Um, there was a hunt for the terrorists who had bombed a nightclub. And um, a story came out about a young woman who was called Europe's first uh, female suicide bomber. And so I became really interested. I was like, wow, OK, who is this person? And, um, and then uh, they started to kind of build her character up as this terrorist. She was reckless. She, she, was, um, she was a party girl who then became a terrorist. And um, there it is. And, and so I followed up, and I got an alert while I was in a rose garden, actually. Um, I got an alert that, that released the audio from the night that she was killed because there was a standoff. And she was begging for her life. And as she was begging for her life, you hear gunshots from the police, and then you hear an explosion from the people that were inside the house. Well, the story was apparently, we don't have the full story, but apparently that she had helped her cousin get an apartment in Saint-Denis, just north of Paris. And, um, and he was hiding out in there. She was there. The police raided it while she was there, kind of opening it up for them. And, um, and she was trying to get out. And she kept saying, I had nothing to do with this. Let me out. She's begging the whole time. And they wouldn't let her out. So um, shots come in. Explosion from someone goes off inside. And it was 
figured out finally forensically that it wasn't her who set off the bomb. But what became really clear at that time, because I wasn't sure, you know, what is her involvement? I'm still kind of digging that because I'm, I'm doing a, a project on it. I wasn't sure, but one thing I did know for sure was that nobody cared whether she died or lived. Nobody cared. Actually, they probably cared that she died more than anything. And that's what made me interested because I got up at that moment and I heard her plea for her life and nobody cared to listen. And I'm looking at roses in a rose garden, roses that I took my very first bath in, um, roses that are indigenous to, to my land, um, that have all been named things like um, Cheryl Teagues and Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan. And I was curious about the names and I was so furious and I was like, these roses all should be renamed after all of these women who are constantly being killed. They're either being killed at the hands of mercenaries, at, at the hands of bombs or drones, by military, or by um, you know, other entities that are entering to continue a war, or in transit or sometimes at the hands of their family. And I wanted to do something about that. So it started out as a graffiti project, and I started to make labels, and you can see it down here. Um, I made labels just at home on cardstock, and I, I usually framed it so that it, it was the same size as the labels that were in the parks. And I just started going around and relabeling all of the, the roses that I saw in the parks. And then I had opportunities to have exhibitions, and I started to dig into the lineage of all of the roses, finding that all hybridized roses, um, their roots go back to um, the Southwest Asian, North African regions that were kind of um, bec because of the soil there. So they all go back there, and uh, they were actually removed out of Damascus by um, a crusader in the Second Crusades who took them to France and kept hybridizing them because he couldn't get them to, to look and smell the same in France. So um, this became an extensive project. This database, um, I got a Creative Capital Fellowship to be able to follow up on it, and I did tons of research, and I started to look at, um, I have so much data on women and girls and femmes who were killed as a result of these wars. And one thing I started to do was I started to also look at how um, nations under threat, um, there became a kind of patriarchal, um, uh, toxic masculinity that happened. And the rates of femicides in domestic violence rose so high that I started to document that as a war crime as well. And so I started to document those girls too. The database here is basically meant to be an intervention project. So it's like an online graffiti project. Um, it's a memorial. And if you look for a rose, let's say you're setting up a garden, my target audience are gardeners, people who love roses in their gardens. And um, if you're looking for a rose, the idea is, I've been working with some engineers, that, that it'll, it'll divert SEO so that, that you can actually see my web page, my database, in the first at least two pages when you do a search for a rose. And let's say you want um, Montezuma Rose, you'll click on um, my database, and up comes Hasna Ebulasen. And it's no longer, that's the, it, the name has been changed, so that's the honorific name. It's no longer called by its um, colonial name on my, on my database, but it still has all of the information on the rose, so if you want to actually plant one, you can, and um, it has the information on the martyr, and, um, and then it has uh, a link that you can purchase the rose outside of, you know, that takes you outside of the database, and you also can purchase a little plaque to put in front of the rose that you buy on my database that has the name of the martyr that's listed. So I wanted to actually give you all, this is just the JPEG, so it's not, I'm not showing you the live version because we're still working out little, little kinks, but this is a preview of the database that's gonna premiere um, in mid-May. Well, I mean, there's so much uh, to say and there's so many layers, I mean, I listening to you and we had conversations before, I mean, what, one of the things that I find striking is, or, or I feel that there is resonance between the way you look at 
um, the killing of girls and women and gender-based violence more broadly. Um, and I guess the way that I've been also doing it in my work and that I think it's very clear that while you have this critique of the war on terror and the use of drone and the, the well, a wider critique really of imperialism, especially the role that the US plays, you don't stop there. You, you are interested in the regional, local actors and perpetrators and that and including, you know, religion, culture, families. And, um, but I wanted to go back to the question of rituals because it's all, uh, also I, I have seen Shia rituals and as you say, I mean, they can be, um, people think of them often as quite sort of scary and violent and also sort of quite macho and masculine. But what you do is you, you, you're subverting these rituals of mourning and rituals of grieving and rituals of endurance. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the ways you're doing it and what's your kind of, well, what are your inspirations? I mean, your inspiration in terms of your family history and uh, your commitment to keep the tradition going, but then the way you subvert these traditions. Yeah. With, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the resonance is, is not um, accidental. Mm -hmm. I, I read your work, and then I go and make my work. So, um, you know, what, what you're doing is, is pretty important um, for, for us artists. Um, what, what was happening when I was doing this research and gathering the data was that I was reading over and over and over again about these horrific incidents of how people were being killed, how women, girls, and femmes were being killed. And it took, it, it weighed on me. It was hard. I could not continue, and I had to stop for a little while. And I just wanted to really engage in some kind of ritual that would give me relief. I do my own uh, dervish practices. I do my own Sufi practices. And so... At that time, I was also organizing, I've, I've started numerous collectives. That's really important to me. I think collective work is, is, um, is really vital. And at that time, I had founded a, a collective called Muzis. Uh, we called ourselves that because someone was derogatorily calling me a Muzi. Um, and, uh, and it was a collective of, of queer um, people who are, fall under the umbrella of Islamic in any way. And some of them were Jewish and many were, were atheists. And, um, and they wanted to have access to their rituals, but were ostracized from their own communities and ostracized from queer communities. And so I wanted to create a safe space and had the opportunity to do that. And in doing so, um, I was one of the old, you know, I was the elder there and people wanted to practice some sort of um, religious rituals, and so we got into you know, chanting together and all of that. And I needed to mourn. So I would gather my collective, and I would do some sort of mourning ritual. And you see that that's specifically what we have on display, actually, in this exhibition. We have um, photographs, documentation from rituals that I did to be able to mourn all of these women that I was documenting because the way that I function is that each woman that I document, I'm having kind of a conversation with her and, um, and I think about her and it haunted me. So I started um, doing, the first one was Puck where I uh, just subverted the ritual of, of cleansing, really thinking about what is cleansing me. And I brought some of the collective together there. And we, uh, you know, first I started it out. I had um, musicians because the, the drama, especially the deaf, is really important for me and my religious practices. I, you know, I remember someone telling me years ago that the deaf, which is a large drum that's um, usually held up, and has chain mail on the inside. That the deaf is the way that many humans believe that they would communicate with the deity. And I, if that really resonated with me because it goes somewhere, the vibration goes somewhere deep in my heart. It's so somatic. So we had the drum 
and um, and we just started to cleanse ourselves over and over again. I put five bowls in a circle. Um, one was water, another one was um, dirt, another one was my favorite theory books, um, torn up in there. I may have torn up uh, some of your articles in there. <laughs> and um, uh, one was a bowl of wine, and another one was a, uh, a bunch of gold party glitter, because I just thought, these are the things that are cleansing me. These are the things that bring me safety and, and peace. And I just cleansed myself over and over again in the ritual cleanse. Um, and you know, other members of the, the collective joined us, and you, you'll see that photograph. And then I started to do other rituals. I want to show a couple yes, of them if I can. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and I, I actually wanted to show this image really quick um, because this is um, inspiration for the costume in the first performance that you'll see because I actually also started a collective that was reading to each other aloud this book the Conference of the Birds. We had um, a few people in, in the collective that had gone through so much trauma that they couldn't, um, they couldn't read the book and they wanted, they wanted to get the information. So uh, we did a read aloud. I actually learned from one of my mentors when he was in prison, he had reading groups and the same sort of trauma was happening and also lack of access to education in prison. And so they had their reading groups where they would read aloud. And I started that with this collective. And so we read this book aloud. And we were really inspired by the birds in the book and the concept of the Simorg, which is the, um, the kind of deity that all the birds were uh, running to. But I'll show you this one first. And no, 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 this one first. And. Um, Let me start it from the beginning, I apologize. There we go. And, and just to describe a little bit, so just before this, um, myself and the museum I was working with, the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, um, we sent out an email to as many people as possible um, asking people to send us their pain um, so that I can actually, um, I felt like I was actually uh, able to use those needles as a conduit to take on their pain. And I did this performance on the 20th anniversary of the initiation of the war on Afghanistan. And it was a path from Leslie Lohman Museum down Broadway and um, into uh, the epicenter and then down into um, the, the park. I'm going to fast forward just a little bit.
and we put the needles in the shape of the Twin Towers on my back. And I wanted my costume to look like the alam that I showed you, so I designed it like the alam, including the headdress. At the bottom, we had dangling. I uh, laser cut some um, some birds, so some of the birds were dangling. And that quote from Atar's book is written on my um, on my costume. They built a shopping mall where there are still people buried. So I uh, basically, I'm going to fast forward a little bit more, um, but basically I started to um, block memorials that were dedicated to war. I did not block this memorial because it wasn't, it was a side of mourning. And then um, I want to show you uh, this other one that I, I did in Los Angeles. It was, it was um, on Hollywood Boulevard. And it was uh, actually the first live stream performance in, in uh, the city of Los Angeles during COVID. So um, this was dedicated to women, girls, and femmes who had been um, killed as a result of um, who, who were killed in a war crime as a result of domestic violence. I did research on that uh, and found uh, so many names. And I decided to um, do a painting with my own blood. And um, I wrote a stream of consciousness um, response to, to uh, the family members of these girls. I, by the way, I also write um, Matam. And that's this song. It's a song of mourning. And there you see me um, uh, drawing my blood. A couple of the rituals. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, quite, uh, I mean, sort of uh, between 
heavy and uh, really challenging and sad, but also, um, well, as someone who's sort of familiar with Shia rituals, um, very inspiring to see how you're kind of turning things around. And also, I guess, the gender dimension, because one of the things that we didn't talk about, but when, in terms of these um, processions of mourning, it's men who are doing the processing of mourning, Correct. right? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, it made yeah. me think about uh, sofre rituals. Mm -hmm. I've attended many of them and I've written a lot about them and how um, the sofre rituals are a gathering for women only, uh, usually in homes, and you call upon uh, a holy figure such as Hassan Mojtaba or Abu Faz, um, but also some women as well. Rogoya. Yeah. yeah, My exactly. mom used to hold the rituals yeah. for Rogoya yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah, but even though you're calling upon men, it's a very personalized ritual where women come together and will cry or celebrate. It could be joyous, it could be mournful, um, but you also make a personal wish. And, mm -hmm. and it was a time for, for women. It was a woman's space. Yeah. And, um, and it have, it was, it's also been sort of reclaimed in many creative ways. Um, in the diaspora and in Iran over the generations. So it's another really important ritual as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it definitely inspired by Sofre. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, that was another thing my mom, when, in, when growing up, she was always holding Sofres in our home. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I always had to help with that ritual. Yeah. And I got to stay. Yeah. So, yes. yeah. 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 Well, um, I can't help but I mean this is not something that we had sort of discussed before but as, as I'm you know listening to you and I'm seeing the images and I'm kind of feeling something in the room I'm I do wonder about perception you know in terms of how does uh, especially a Western non-Muslim audience uh, viewership what are the reactions and I mean I guess for me Again, drawing parallels, I'm always worried when I write about um, gender-based violence in the Middle East and worry that that might contribute to the already existing stereotypes about you know, these oppressive Muslims. Now, rituals like that um, are used, I mean, certainly the, the traditional, you know, the sort of Shia rituals are often used to, to show how barbaric, how violent these people are. And um, so putting needles in your back is also a form of self-harm and violence. And so how, you know, how do you negotiate that, you know, that, that sort of being based in, in the States and having, being aware of the stereotypes, um, wanting to subvert, being committed to the girls and women who have been killed, but at the same time also committed to challenging, yeah. you know, existing Um You, you know, I, I, I think I gave two master classes, and the first master class was um, really focused on my earlier work where a lot of it was a reaction and it was a reaction to the white gaze. And, um, and the second one was not. And I think I got to a point where I just um, stopped trying to explain myself. Mm -hmm. And I started to make work for what I considered my tribe. Now my tribe is not necessarily Iranian. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to make work and bouncing off community that I was building. And I've worked very hard in community building for many, many years. So in, in doing that work and bouncing off of my community and wanting to have a, wanting to, reading your work and wanting to kind of have my own response to it because I'm, I get stuck with words. I, I don't have, uh, you know, for me, it, I'm, I'm interested in a visual, tactile, sonic language. I, um, I love reading, but I can't express myself in the same way. So um, wanting to have a response to that. So I fill myself with knowledge that I think is important to um, define those boundaries. And then I allow myself to make the work 
freely. Because I feel like once I've filled myself with that knowledge, once I've gone into that, those practices within my community, then it becomes automated. Um, and to a certain extent it does. And I do, I do um, bounce it off of my community constantly. I do um, really have conversations with people about my work and sometimes you know they'll argue something that i don't agree with but it's a good opportunity um you know having the, these dialogues amongst um amongst people is really important it's a good opportunity to if i really feel strongly about my work to actually stand by it you know so um so i think that's the way i do it um again the the building of collectives and um challenging one another is really important and I did do the, I have done that one too, and that's on display upstairs, um, where, you know, I, I used the chain on my back and, you know, it was blistered and bleeding and everything else. And the tribe that I'm talking about, it was pretty mixed. Mm -hmm. So I did reach out to people from the Southwest Asian, North African, East African communities. But um, also the person that, that um, was my wrangler and took care of me and healed my back and completely understood my ritual is um, someone who's, who's uh, Chicana and Filipinx. You know, she's, uh, she was not uh, from those regions. Um, other people in, in the community that were, you know, totally diverse. So I think when I say tribe at that point, it became, it, it became people that are also... Um, not necessarily regionally, my tribe. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm conscious of time. Should we open up? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. yes. So um, we have a uh, few minutes uh, mm -hmm. for questions, comments. Um, if you could use the microphone uh, because we're live streaming. And I did put up some new images, so if you want to ask about that, feel free. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you were there, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I missed this, unfortunately. Yeah. So I don't have a question only that I want you to, I would love to hear sure. more about this. Sure. So, um, you, you know, uh, the Venice Biennale opened. Um, it's called Foreigners Everywhere and the theme. And um, a lot of the pavilions really dedicated themselves to that, uh, that idea. And just before that, um, there was a petition going around among uh, artists and cultural producers to um, boycott the Israeli pavilion this year. They said, well, you know, Russia's been boycotted. Can, um, can we boycott the Israeli pavilion? And the um, organizers of, of the Venice Biennale, not the curators, the organizers, um, made the decision that, no, nope, it's going to move forward. And um, in the end, it was 25,000 artists and cultural practitioners who signed this document. So that's a lot of people that were ignored. And I'd been having some conversations with friends. I wasn't planning on going to the BNL, but um, you know, upon reading this, I thought, uh, I should go. I've, I've never been. I didn't even know how to plan this um, because people were like, well, it's, it's in the Giardini. No, it's in the art. I, I'm like, what is the Giardini? What, what are these things? I have no idea. I've never been. Um, so just trying to work it out. But I reached out to a few friends, and um, my collaborators are really, really lovely. Um, uh, first, it was Courtney Baker, who I work with in Los Angeles. She's an academic, and, um, and uh, she writes about... Um, uh, the capturing of the violence, the image capturing of the violence of black bodies. And, um, and then we reached out to Maza Mengiste, who's a great novelist, has an incredible book out. And then we reached out to Fatina Bas, who's also a great um, novelist. And um, I reached out to Daniela uh, Lieja Quintenar, who is a curator I've worked with, and, um, and I see a, a couple of heads shaking that know her, who's a lovely, amazing curator. And she curated the piece where I was um, writing on Hollywood Boulevard. And she and I have worked on issues around femicide for many years. 
So um, the five of us got together, and we were very fortunate because at the time, a friend of mine organizes a conference called um, Black Portraiture. And so um, a lot of people came over to support us from Black Portraiture Conference. And, um, and we decided that we needed to do something to mourn because um, the theme of the Israeli pavilion was motherland. And just the term mother broke my heart. Um, but this claiming of a motherland through a pavilion, through an arts pavilion, through something that um, comes together in so many ways, right next to it, Jeffrey Gibson con talking about peace, talking about love, something that comes together every year and brings nations together in love, um, claiming a, a homeland, and and um, and it became an, a kind of notion of violence. And I thought about all of the mothers that were not being mourned, all of the mothers who had been killed. So I reached out to, to this community of lovely people and I said, can we do a ritual? And got some roses. I work a lot with roses, as you see. And um, we wrote the names. I did research and I only did research from October 19th through the 21st and got 175 names of mothers that were recovered who whose names were recovered, who were killed in the recent genocide in Gaza. And, um, and we wrote those 175 names on rose petals, and we um, did the ritual right outside there. And um, we also went around town and we got the um, words that were written on the Al-Shifa hospital, and because uh, I was labeling something and I found this thing, the Brother P touch, it's so exciting. You can, I was like, we should do poetry with this. So I'd called Maza about doing poetry and I thought, well, let's do the Al-Shifa hospital stuff. And, um, and so uh, we got the words that were written on the Al-Shifa hospital. We wrote it in English because we were communicating with that audience in particular. And we went to the events where the Vien Venice Biennale was happening and we put the Brother P. Touch labels with uh, you know, the statements that people wrote on the walls of Al-Shifa Hospital there. So um, that's what we did. And, and the police uh, came over, they stopped us, and they asked us for our immigration documents. Yeah, and we weren't the only ones because just before that I was in the Dutch Pavilion where there's a really beautiful show of um, a lot of miners and laborers in the Congo who had come together and created artwork. And um, they had been hiring also some of the laborers from the Congo to do the documentation and be present. And I saw the police follow, um, basically following people who were in their pavilions to take that as an opportunity to detain and um, deport. So it was happening throughout foreigners everywhere in the Venice uh, Biennale, not at the hands of the curators, of course, and artists at the hands of uh, the new fascist regime. So, gosh, uh, there any other questions or comments? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. Um, of course, I'm very interested in this. Thanks for the kind words. I'm, I'm very, I want to acknowledge how great this project on um, gender, body politics, the Middle East, I'm so glad you're doing that, and so this is an important contribution. I've been I'm very interested in um, morning rituals. Luckily, I've been able to be in Iran to see Ashura, and um, it's fantastic the way you can subvert that in, in your work. But it also, and it made me think that maybe a way to extend this, because you're so interested in community, is um, the tazie, the, um, so much of the shora and mourning in Iran, for those who don't know it, lasts a month, uh, has, is about this passion play. And that's been used so much in politics to reinscribe certain values way beyond its religious significance. I don't have to tell anybody in the, on the panel this, but uh, because you are subverting, and in the honor of women and, and girls and femmes, I wonder with your community, there would be a way for also you, and you're obviously a performer, performer that you could 
do some version of Tazie in whatever location, but bringing together some community and en enrolling and subverting that story in honor of the women and, and kids that are killed in, in war. And can I ask you to first give a very brief sort of explanation of Tazie, because I'm not sure that okay. everyone is aware. Uh, the Tazie is a, is a passion play that happens. It's, it's a street play. It's, it's um, basically, um, I, I think there are so many cultures that do the street plays, but it's a street play. And um, it is about the, the it's a commemoration also uh, of the assassination of the Prophet's family. So it's, it's also recognizing um, that incident. But, um, but it's played out by different actors. And interestingly, um, it's always the actor that plays Shemr, who is the, the enemy who, who kills Imam Hussein. They, they have a hard time in, in the communities. They like run around and they, people will spit on them. So I've always been uh, interested in the people that play Shemr. I, um, I am not necessarily someone who is um, a performer, like a theatrical performer. Um, I don't have the interest in performing in that way, but I would definitely support anyone in my community who would do that. I, you know, do whatever they they uh, needed if they need me to make costumes or you know do whatever it is because uh, I'll do the grunt work. My my interest really lies in um, the rituals and the song. So I have been focusing, and what you don't see in the exhibition upstairs is the writing of a matam which is the songs of mourning. Um, so I write those. I, you don't want me to perform them, because I, if I sang, you all would be mourning, just <laughs> your, your ears. So um, I, I don't sing them, and I don't perform them musically, but um, I write the songs. And so I decided to take my focus in that way. I think it would be really interesting. And there is an artist, I want to say. Oh my gosh, if, if uh, some friends are here that focus on, on the theatrical end, there is an artist that's doing a queer um, tazie. I, I definitely, if, if someone wanted me to play Shemra, I would play Shemra. I would be interested. I love wearing red, too. So, yeah. <laughs> OK, I'm going to ask Catherine maybe to ask uh, one last question, question, unless if there's anyone else like to. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as Iran and Iranians are still reeling from the Masa Amini protests and the ongoing um, government crackdowns, which are getting worse and worse in recent days, um, you know, and we have the escalating geopolitical tensions with, with Israel, which are reaching a real critical juncture, uh, I'm just wondering how you are navigating and processing all of these complex layers of these crises in your work. Um, well, what, one thing is that, that um, what I was noticing is that in a lot of family dynamics, so if we bring the global back into the house, right, um, in family dynamics, um, a lot of times uh, girls or the child who's queer in the family, the person that's seen as weak, um, they become the repositories of blame. And so when the tensions are high, the rates of femicide really increase. And so I start to document that. And I'm definitely concerned about that. Um, I'm sure it's going gonna, it's gonna to get even higher. When, when the protest, when Masa Amini was killed, um, I think ev everyone saw it. It became very public. Now, the, the killing of, of um, the, the disregard and the killing of ethnic minorities, in particular the girls of ethnic minorities, is not something brand new in Iran. It's been ongoing. And um, I'm glad that, that uh, at least through the sad martyrdom of, of Masa Amini, we were, supposed to, we, we were able to see um, you know, how this young Kurdish woman was being treated in, in Iran by the police. Um, and then we started to see people who had solidarity with her get treated the same way. Um, and then girls were starting to show their agency. And it was in re reaction, obviously, to the agency that we started to see more and more street deaths, but also femicides within the home. You know, um, 
that's what I want to focus on. I really want to focus and may, maybe through, I don't know, my little work and um, the work of other artists that are um, starting to really focus on this as a war crime, as a continuation of the war crime, as, as a form of internalized. I mean, I'm a Fanonian in the end, you know, I, I, I black skin, white mass, you know, learning about the internalized colon, colonization is like, is, is um, I, I could recite it to you um, right here. And, um, and, and the idea that we've turned it inside and, and are doing this within our own families um, is really something that I hope to bring some awareness to, that I hope to be, be able to have some agency and talk about. Um, and, or if nothing else, I hope to be the, you know, the, the cool drink of water that some of the women in Iran and other places need to drink or here <laughs> need to drink so that, that um, they feel a little like there's someone that, that feels what they're feeling. Well, thank you very much, uh, Amitis. Uh, I would like to thank you all for coming and maybe a round of applause to thank you. Now, those of you who are joining us online will not be able to uh, come and join us in the reception, but I hope you in the room will come. Just one floor up uh, will be for another hour or so. <laughs>